OK, good. And for the sake of the video, those are just some of the benefits of an all-cheese diet. OK, um, so capsicum, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, is a framework that we have in FreeBSD for doing application compartmentalization, uh, which is a very, very long word, but we're just breaking applications up into pieces that can be mutually distrustful. One kind of simple example of compartmentalization is sandboxing, where you're taking a whole application, you're throwing it into a box, and you're saying, OK, you can play with the toys that are in your sandbox, but you can have no durable, lasting impact on the world outside of your sandbox, except as we specifically allow. Uh, so Capscom is a framework that does this compartmentalization thing. Um, so we're subdividing applications. Um, and when we're doing sandboxing in particular, it's kind of like you know companies who we might be happy with these days like to do things like putting user data keys out of their own reach. So the company themselves are not able to decrypt their users' data. Right? That's the sort of thing that we give a thumbs up for. Let's have a big applause, round of applause for companies who do that. Yeah, who shall remain nameless. Um, but this is the kind of thing we want to do. We want applications to well, Capscom allows applications to put authority outside of their own reach so they can no longer perform certain actions so that they can't harm the users who are running the software or other applications. Now I say that it is principled and coherent. What I mean by that, uh, so when it's principled, so there is actually a lot of history of computer security research and there were some really, really nice ideas that some folks had uh, way back in the 70s. Um, which kind of got lost along the way. So in some sense, Capsicum is about recovering something that was lost. Um, so one of the really useful ideas from the 1970s that people had was a monotonic reduction of authority. So you could say, I have the authority to do X, Y, and Z. And then you could monotonically take away some of that and say, now I have the authority to do X and Y. And then you could hand that authority off to somebody else. And they could take and say, OK, actually, now it's just the authority to do Y and hand that off to somebody somebody else. And so this monotonic reduction of authority is a very useful principle to use when we're thinking about how to do computer security. Um, but it's also a very coherent model. It's a coherent security model in that uh, the policies are very simple and very clear, and they allow for a uniform application across uh, applications, I guess. Um, there are lots of ways of creating security policies in which um, application developers have to decide lots of complex questions around security and that mechanisms that allow application developers to express policies that may not actually provide the protection they would like to provide. If you have a policy that does not allow you to access the disk, but does allow you to access the network, and you're running NFS, well, I think you see where this is going, right? It is possible to express a policy um, which is n incoherent in that maybe you're not allowed to do something that you wanted to do through the front door, but you can still go through the back door. And of course, well, attackers love back doors. It's kind of what they do. Uh, so we want to have a policy that is very simple to express and which, once we have that limitation of authority, then, then we have to find ways to give back just the things you want to do because application should, developers should be experts in what their applications should do, not experts in what their applications shouldn't do. So rather than starting from a position of, OK, let's cut off this access and this access and this access. OK, now are you secure? Mm, I don't know. We're going to start from a position of, OK, now you can't do any of these, 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 these things. You can't have any durable effect on the, on the real world. Now the question is, does your application work? And if the answer is no, then OK, we can incrementally add things back, not through the security mechanism, but through existing Unix uh, file descriptor sharing type mechanisms. So once again, the developers should be experts in what their applications should do, not and leave the security people, the curmudgeons, to worry about what applications shouldn't do. So, Capscom has two main ideas, and they're both quite simple ideas. Uh, the first one is capability mode. So you can take a process and you can put it into a mode called capability mode by calling the syscall cap enter. When you're in capability mode, there is no more access to global namespace. You cannot 
open files. You cannot connect sockets with addresses. You cannot access PIDs or file systems IDs or NFS file handles or any of these other namespaces that exist in a Unix system. No global namespace access allowed. You can access whatever files you already have open, you know, file descriptors and things, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Uh, but you can't access or you can't acquire new resources from a global namespace. Um, so this behaves like the Hotel California. You can, uh, you can always check in. You can never check out. Um, so once a process goes into capability mode, it's in capability mode. If it forks, execs, does whatever, uh, it and all of its descendants are going to remain in capability mode. This flag is set on a process credential and it's never cleared. Now this provides a very, very strong level of isolation. If a process starts, and the first thing it does is call cap enter, then you have a very strong guarantee that it is not going to cause any data corruption or uh, attack other programs or doing anything malicious. Um, of course, well, that's only half of the story. So I'm going to show you a picture of a very, very secure, I would say, uh, hacker proof system. There we go. So nobody is going to use this and or nobody's going to break into this anvil in order to steal credit card details. Nobody's going to use it to uh, to mess with. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we found the owner of the the power brick. All right, let's give our, our assistant a hand. No one's going to use this to do very much that's malicious, right? But of course, it's also not a very useful system. It's not very programmable or generative. So it's not enough to prevent malicious, malicious sharing. Capability mode does that all by itself. We must also enable controlled sharing in ways, ideally, that align well to existing developer notions of how uh, computers and applications can communicate with each other. So capability mode was part one. Part two is capabilities. So capabilities are file descriptors, but they're not just file descriptors. So a long time ago when dinosaurs were roaming the earth and Unix was still a twinkle in Ken Thompson's eye, um, there was this idea of a thing called a capability. And a capability would be something which is both an identifier for an object, but also that expresses the operations that you can perform on that object. So uh, Dennis and Van Horn identified this as a very useful idea um, in the 60s, actually. And they're just identifying things that were already happening with running hardware, the Burroughs 5000 and machines like that. Um, and they said, you will have these capabilities that will be stored in a thing called a C list, short for capability list, maintained by the supervisory part of the software running on one of these machines. And the way that the non-supervisory software would access it would be with an index into this list. Now, does that sound at all familiar? Well, it should a little bit. Um, all right, because historic capabilities uh, were very influential on the design of the PSOS, which is a paper operating system, the pr provably secure operating system, whose ideas were massively influential on Multics, which of course then uh, through a certain pun that I won't go into at the moment, but you can, uh, you can ask your folks later, uh, turned into Unix when it was a simplified, cut down design, one might say. Um, and so somewhere between this historic notion of capabilities and Unix, we ended up with file descriptors. But something was lost along the way. So file descriptors in some ways are a bit like capabilities. Uh, they, we have an index into a kernel maintained array of things that represent identities of objects in the system as well as operations that we can perform on them, read and write and stuff. So we can limit operations that can be performed on open files, for example. Um, however, the thing that was lost was a really principled focus on this idea of monotonic reduction. So file descriptors carry lots 
and lots of implicit rights and ambient authority that gets associated with them because instead of just relying on capabilities for the security model, at some point we decided that access control lists were a good idea and discretionary access control and well, you can debate that later, but right now this is what, this is what was decided and so file systems of access control lists and we have the Unix permissions model on files, um, which means that we lost some of this stuff. So now, if you hold a file descriptor, the question as to what are you allowed to do to that file is not entirely determined by the properties of that file descriptor. It is also determined by, well, what's your user ID? And what's the user ID of the directory that you're operating in? Um, so you can open the file, read only, and so you think, okay, so you can read from the file and nothing else, right? No, you can chmod it. You can do all kinds of funny things to files that you have opened allegedly read-only because we have a conflation of security models which allows rights amplification. You can do more with this file than you might expect looking at the code because of where that file happens to be in the file system, which is not visible here. So there's a rights amplification that incurs. So there's lots of implicit rights that get carried around with plain old Unix file descriptors. So, what capabilities do in Capsicum um, is to put some of this rigor back into the expression of file descriptors. Um, so we have um, a representation inside of the FreeBSD kernel. So we do have things that will look a little bit familiar when we're talking about C lists and things. Every uh, process structure will have a file desk structure which will have a file descriptor entry table which will have file descriptor entries. Each file descriptor entry which is shown over here will have a pointer to a struct file which is a useful thing but also it will have one of these file cap structures which describes some rights, things that you're allowed to do with a capability as well as some expressions of uh, what ioctals and what f controls you're allowed to do with that particular file. So we can have a really fine-grained discussion of exactly what operations can be performed, which not one-to-one, -one, but kind of map to system calls, uh, as well as uh, what ioctals and f controls are, are allowed. So the rights that we express as capability rights are things like read, but also things like truncate or nmap or chmod. So all the other things that you want to do with files besides read and write, the things that aren't or read, write, and execute, uh, they're all expressed. And so we, at first, we had 50-something you know, of these rights, and they fit in a 64-bit bit mask. And now there are more than 64 of them, so there's a slightly more complicated data structure. Uh, but Pavel, who's not here at the moment, had an ingenious, uh, clever solution, and it's clever in both the good way and the bad way. It's clever in that it solves the problem, and it's also clever in the sense that it's slightly surprising the first time you look at it, but actually it's a pretty sensible solution, uh, and we can look at that later. Um, so those are the two main aspects of Capsicum. There's capability mode, which is all about cutting off access to global namespaces, and then there's capabilities, which allow us to provide access to uh, file-based resources, but in a very fine-grained way. I can take a capability that allows me to read and seek and truncate and nmap, and I can turn that into a capability that's only allowed to read and not even allowed to seek. And then I can take that one, which has been more limited, and hand that off to a child process and say, okay, worker process, you are allowed to do less with this file than I am. I'm allowed to read and write, but this worker process, which is gonna be exposed to untrusted garbage from the internet, it's just going to be allowed to read and it's not going to be allowed to write. We can have this very fine-grained delegation of rights. Um, all right, and here's the, the very clever thing, which you can go look up later, cap rights in it. Um, right, and so system calls um, interact with capabilities as follows. Open gives you file descriptors that have all rights. Now, ooh, what's, what's going on there? That seems a bit funny. Why do why does open give you all rights? Huh? Uh, because it always has, and we have to have some kind of backwards compatibility for applications that are not running in capability mode. In capability mode, open is just not allowed at all because that would access a global namespace. It can't be done. Uh, outside of capability mode, we need file descriptors to behave as they always have, so that applications will keep running. So it gives all rights, cap rights, limits, limit. Uh, imposes limitations on open file descriptors. Um, 
things like accept and open at uh, or you know, other kinds of functions that uh, at functions that derive new file descriptors from old ones, they uh, derive their limits from the limits on the things that you passed in. So if you have a directory descriptor with certain rights, then when you open at relative to that descriptor, the new thing you get will be limited in at least the same ways and possibly more limited. Okay, so using capsicum in practice, oh, now I did say at the beginning, get this out of your system, uh, but, well, never mind. So this is how uh, you apply capsicum to, well, the true binary. Um, yeah. More seriously, uh, so here's an example from Beehive. And again, it's actually quite simple. The two aspects of capsicum, um, we need to enter capability mode as we're doing here, and if that doesn't work, then we can fail out. Um, and we also need to provide some limitation on file descriptors that we've already opened. So in this case, uh, there's actually a helper function in user include capsicum helpers, uh, which just calls cap rights limit and limits ioctals and other things on standard in and standard out and standard air and things. Uh, and here we're limiting standard out and standard air. Um, but there's something else going on here. Cache cat pages. And well, that's a bit funny. So we'll, we'll come back to that idea. Oh, by the way, I should say, questions at any point, please feel free to jump in. I like things to be interactive. And if I'm going to have any hope of keeping you all awake until the party, uh, then, well, you'll need to. So jump in at any time. OK, so this is kind of nice. It allows us to do certain things. And some applications can be compartmentalized quite easily in a quite effective way that gives us very strong confidence. When we say, this application has been capsicumized, then that means something quite strong. And we have some ideas about exactly what that means, because it's a very simple, straightforward policy, easy to understand. But there is a real limitation with capsicum uh, as she is played right now, which is that applications have to compartmentalize themselves. They have to sandbox themselves. They have to voluntarily give up these rights. They have to prepare themselves to enter capability mode by accessing all the resources that they need to do their jobs. And then they enter capability mode, and now things are safer than they would have been otherwise. But the application itself has to be involved. So it's OK for things in like the base system. But it's not a very scalable approach for sandboxing all the things. So our long-term goals, what we, what we really want to do, and this is part of our larger research agenda, as well as a practical open source, giving the world better software sort of agenda, um, is that we want to have compartmentalization, or at least sandboxing, without, well, we want to have compartmentalization without modifying applications. Take existing applications, break them up into a bunch of little chunks, and have them run in independent, mutually distrustful sandboxes without actually changing the applications at all. A first step towards that is just sandboxing. Take this whole application and drop it in a sandbox and let it run without having to modify it at all. And then as we get more sophisticated and inject compilers and things into the mix, then maybe we'll do real compartmentalization. So we want to protect ourselves from applications, whether they like it or not. Um, which is, you know, by the way, what's happening with something like the App Store on Mac OS X, a popular FreeBSD derivative, perhaps one can get away with calling it. Um, every application that you download from the App Store is mandatorily running inside of a sandboxing framework, and it is limited and not allowed to do certain things. And this is a model where wouldn't it be lovely if every binary that you uh, installed from a package and ran had some kind of sandboxing properties associated with it, and you could figure out what they are. All right, uh, so this is the old way. This is what you have to do, sandboxing as she is played right now with Capsicum. Uh, so if you have a shell and you want to uh, execute an application and you want it to run in a sandbox, well, you probably do fork and then exec or fexec or fexec ve. You execute this application. And the first thing that actually happens, of course, is that the runtime linker runs. So the kernel maps a runtime linker into memory. It maps an application into memory and says, dear runtime linker, here Here's the application, go, start doing your thing. And the runtime linker will go out and find a bunch of libraries, and then eventually main will run. The application will open some resources that it needs to do its job. And then it calls cap enter, and OK, now we are in a compartment. We have access to the resources that we previously opened. 
Um, but that's it. So, uh, uh, look at that. Open resources cap enter compute. I'm just watching to see who's looking at the screen now. No? Uh, okay. Uh, right. So, and the resources that we can open, some of them are going to be the sort of thing that we can write down in advance, statically say, here are the things I need to do, to do my job. Um, and some of these resources may be provided externally. Something really simple like cat is quite capable of listing here. Uh, well, actually, cat's slightly more complicated. Who would have thought that cat was complicated? I mean, cat, it knows what resources are. You can describe in code what those resources are going to be, but their names are dynamic. Depends what the user typed in. Um, but still, somewhat statically enumerable. But in some cases, we need new resources on an ongoing basis. You know, This model doesn't fit a web browser, whereas Capscom does. And we did Capscomize Chrome. And if only everything else about Chrome worked on FreeBSD, maybe we could put the patches upstream. All right, uh, so what kinds of resources do applications tend to depend on? So some of them are quite explicit. Uh, so we can identify, oh, here's some file descriptors. We have files and directories and sockets. And file descriptors refer to all of these things, so that's very nice. Um, and we can handle those by pre-opening them. So before we call cap enter, we can open or we can open files and directories and we can use open at later with those directories. So we can open those things and those things are actually preserved across exec. You exec an application and you, unless it's set to be closed on exec, you still have access to that file inside of your uh, newly executed or process. So that's great. So we can fork, we can open some directory descriptors, uh, we can you know, set environment variables if we need to to pass information across to the thing we're executing. Uh, cap entry can be called at some point. Um, but there's a piece missing, which I promise we'll get to really soon now. Um, in some cases, we also have external services that we need to be able to access. Um, so in FreeBSD, there is a library called libcaspa, which is part of the story. And uh, part of the goal here is to get us to the place where our applications start actually needing to use libcasper so we can start really pushing on it and then expanding its use. Um, at the moment, the applications are not full functional enough in Capsicum to even worry about this, but we're going to get there now thanks to some of this new work. Um, but there are things like Powerbox services that you do see. So again, for those using that popular FreeBSD derivative called Mac OS X, um, when you open a file from within an application that you downloaded from the App Store, it doesn't pop open a dialog that says, what file do you want to open? Actually, it sends a message to a service that is part of the system as opposed to part of the application, which asks the user, what file do you want me to open and give to that application? And then after you open it, then that application is granted the authority to access it. So the application can't access all your stuff. You know, Microsoft Word or whatever can only access the file that you give it which is good because you probably don't want Microsoft Word parsing you know, whatever stuff it wants. All right, uh, so those are explicit resources, but even more interesting are the things that we implicitly depend on without even thinking about it. So uh, for example, you might have noticed earlier uh, when I showed you the Beehive example, we entered capability mode. Just before that, we limited some files that we had access to, uh, standard in and out streams. But we also called this other helper function called capH cache cat pages. It's like, oh, what's that all about? Well, what that is all about is that there are certain things that libc implicitly wants access to under the hood without asking you, such as for those who don't like man pages, there are cat pages, which is an even lower level mechanism than man pages. There are also things like locale data. If you try to uh, call syslog, the syslog function is going to want to print the date in your process and send that to the syslog daemon. Printing the date requires looking up the time zone. Time zone data is stored in a file on the hard drive that you need to access. So uh, there are some cases where there are things like locale data that you, you might not think your application is opening those files, but actually it is. So some of these implicit dependencies need to be dealt with, um, such as through these helper functions that uh, Marius has created in that revision. Um, but then there are things like shared libraries. You know, if you're running code, there's a very good chance that m it's, uh, it's unlikely that you are running statically linked applications, except for a very few specific examples. Even cat, even echo needs 
libc. Okay? There are lots of good reasons to use dynamic linking, um, so we have to deal with this. If we were to run an application from inception in a sandbox, and the runtime linker were to run in it and say, okay, I want to open slash lib slash libc. Sorry, you can't. That's in a global namespace. You can't access it. So we need to sort this out. Because at least until now, uh, neither exec nor runtime linking would work from within capability into mode. So remember, if our goal here is to have applications with which, without modifications, we are running them from inception in a sandbox. We're starting a sandbox and then running the application instead of running the application and letting it sandbox itself. Well, then we have to deal with this. We have to sort this out. So, how does exec work without a name? So, traditionally, and this is the picture we saw before, you know, we'll fork a child process, we'll exec a binary, and execing will clean up all of our memory mappings and things. It'll close any uh, clear exec files. Um, but we'll preserve other open files and environment variables. It will run this application. We'll find the binary by name. The kernel will take a name. It will go to the file system. It will find that binary. It will mmap it, and then some magic happens will transfer control not to the application itself, but to the runtime linker. So there is a deeply problematic phrase here. Uh, it finds a binary by name and maps and transfers control to the linker. So uh, this is not going to work, but not for one reason, for three. So the first problem is kind of obvious. So we're going to find the binary by name. OK, well, we've got a solution for that. And uh, that's easy. What do we do? So if you can't, if we want to start a sandbox and then exec a binary, but we can't use exec because it used paths, then what's the obvious answer? F exec, yes. OK, good. So F exec VE. Uh, we have a file descriptor lying around because we opened it before we started the sandbox. We can say, OK, dear kernel, execute that, um, <laughs> except on Linux. Um, so we f exec uh, the binary, and uh, we pass it some args, and we pass it some environment variables. Pause for just a second while somebody tests the waters to see if they believe me about being interactive. No? OK. You can ask later if you like. It is kind of funny. Um, so that's what first problem, find the binary by name. The second problem, however, uh, is mmap. But you might think, wait, what's wrong with mmap? You said you're allowed to mmap things in capability mode. That's true, you are. But the question is, what are we going to map? Because it's not just the binary. So uh, the way this works, when we call f exec ve, uh, you can pass in a file descriptor for the binary you want to exec. That's going to go down into a function, which calls a function, which calls a function, because we love us some indirection, that's for sure. Um, and then we're going to look through all of the possible ways of executing that binary until we find, OK, how do we execute a binary with this particular sequence of bits? We want to support lots of different image formats. So ELF, a.out, shell scripts. You might want to support uh, you know, Linux binaries. You might want to support binaries for other architectures that you do clever things with Kimu with. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of binaries you might want to run. So we've got lots of different image activators that we can run. So a process might be tagged as using a particular uh, image activator because we know things about the architecture that it's simulating or something. Um, then we have a bunch of image activators that we can check in turn. How about this one? How about this one? How about this one? The ELF image activator, uh, we can find that and we can say, dear ELF image activator, do you know how to handle this kind of file? And it'll, it'll look at the file and it'll say, oh yeah, this is the sort of thing that I know to handle. OK, yes, I can activate that image for you. All right. And then it will call this function, which in trying to understand how all this stuff works and add another version of the exec system call, um, I just need to take a pause and just give a shout out to C. because. C-scope didn't like this very much. Um, and you might think this doesn't actually really look like a function name. And whether or not you're right depends on whether this is before or after the preprocessor runs. Because these names of functions are being preprocessed in advance so that we can have a 32-bit and a 64-bit version of the same functions in, ah, thank you very much, C Pro Processor. So these are some of the macros that you have to look through if you want to figure out what's the function that's actually being called here. So that's just a little aside. Thanks, C. Thanks very much. 
not that C++ templates are great in an objective sense, but you know, they, they're hard in a different way. Okay, um, and in a way that C-Scope understands. All right, so to get back to the story, we're activating this image. So we have a binary, we have a file descriptor for it, so we're in a capability mode. We're allowed to do things with file descriptors that have already been opened. Uh, we have cap exec and cap mmap and cap read and all kinds of good uh, capability or rights associated with this capability, so excellent. Um, so we find an image activator that knows how to read this file. It looks at the beginning at the header and says, ooh, this looks like an elf file. Yep, I know what to do with those. Um, and then we run the elf image activator, which says, all right, first thing I need to do is look inside of this elf file and find a program header table. And the program header table can have a bunch of entries, including an interpreter, a runtime interpreter. Which, if you look at FreeBSD base system binaries, you'll discover there is a path slash libexec slash ld dot so elf, sorry, ld hyphen elf dot so dot one embedded directly in all those binaries. And they say, here's the runtime linker that you should run me with, please. And then the image activator will go get that linker. It will grab the linker, it will grab the binary, map them into memory, start running the linker. That's what it normally does. What's the problem now in capability mode? It's a name lookup. The linker is specified by the path. Whether uh, it's in PT interp or whether we just fall back to a default list of linkers um, or a default linker name, it's always specified by path. And even though this is deep inside the kernel, we still know, hey, I'm running on behalf of a process that is in capability mode. I'm not allowed to do name lookups. When I try to do the name lookup, it's going to fail. Um, so in capability mode, we know that the open syscall is disabled. But it's a deeper surgery on the kernel that we had to do than just disabling a system call at the shallow level, because otherwise you could sneak names in the back door in PT interp fields and all kinds of weird stuff, right? Um, you could say, well, I'm going to exec that binary over there, but its PT interp field is set to the application that I actually want to run, which is statically linked, and boom, I'm running arbitrary code, right? This is not what we want. Um, so open is not allowed, but also there's all name lookups in the FreeBSD kernel are disallowed when you're doing, uh, when you're in capability mode. And it's done in the place where names are turned into files in the function called nameI, which is, um, well, it's kind of like a wizard. You do not meddle in the affairs of wizards for they are subtle and quick to anger. NameI and lookup are a little bit like that, right? Um, so <laughs> nonetheless, we did meddle because we had to. And so deep in Nameai, there are places where if, we're in capa if the current thread is in capability mode, which is a, actually a property of the process, but you know, the thread, we get to the process. Uh, if we're in capability mode, uh, and if this flag is not set, and this flag is only ever set for core dumps, because core dumps are nice even when you're in capability mode, then all lookups have to be strictly relative. No absolute paths, no dot dot, no starting from the current working directory. It has to be strictly relative to a file descriptor, which is the case when you have open at or stat at or access at or something. Um, and you know, if you try to do any of these things like use a dot dot or start from an absolute path, well, then we return e not capable and go to bad. It's not quite the same as go to fail, but um, yeah, so this is actually, although this seems kind of annoying and arcane, it's actually a very desirable property of the fact that we did this work deep in the kernel rather than some kind of a shallow system call wrapper or just at the syscall layer. This gives us a lot of confidence that not only are we disabling specific things, but actually we have really managed to cut off all access to global namespaces by doing it deep in the kernel at just the right place so that we can be confident that nobody's getting name accesses in through the back door in ways that we didn't think about. So we can't look up a linker. Oh well, I guess we should go home. No, no, not quite. It's not yet time for the party. All right, um, so if we can't look up the path and we can't use the PT interp path, where can we get the linker? Well, here's my solution. I'm going to punt on that question. Uh, in that, and so for the, uh, the Cantabrigians, well, singular, I guess, in the room, uh, yeah, uh, punting. Um, so what we actually say is, uh, okay, user, uh, if you want me to execute something and you want it to have a linker, well, you tell me what linker to use. Okay, thanks, bye. 
Um, so it is fundamentally an issue of executing things obliviously from within sandboxes that somebody's going to have to figure out, well, where do I even get linkers to run things with? So there's going to have to be some knowledge of ABIs encoded somewhere. At the moment, in the prototype stuff that we're doing, this is stuff we have to do explicitly, but obviously uh, next steps would be, well, this could go in the library where you could say, would you please taste this binary and tell me what linker we ought to be using? Or maybe there's a system service that we provide, which is, can you get me the correct linker? Give me the file descriptor for the sort of linker that we ought to use when we're executing this file descriptor. And so in some sense, we leave that for future work. Um, so initially, we thought, OK, let's create a new version of exec, because the name isn't getting complicated enough. We'll have an FF exec VE2. Um, and give it, pass in a linker and pass in a binary. Uh, but actually, the approach that we ended up hitting on was uh, just to make the linker executable and make it take a file descriptor as an argument. Uh, so the FreeBSD linker, as of a couple of weeks ago, thanks to Constantine, is now directly executable. It used to do this, and then it didn't, and now it does again. Um, but what we've added for Capscom purposes is this argument. So instead of searching for the binary name, so you can run ldf.so and pass it a binary name and some arguments, or now you can, before you pass in the binary name, you can specify a file descriptor number. File descriptor 7 contains the binary that I want you to actually um, you know, map and execute and interpret and do all the things with, please. So like before, you can fork, you can open some directory descriptors, you can pass information through with setenv, you can call cap enter. Um, but now the new bit is that we fexec the linker itself with some arguments plus we add on you know, dash f the binary and then we pass some environment things through and here's some of the commits so you can try this on freebsd current now you can just execute things all right uh so yeah let, let's do a little demo in fact so first of all i guess uh so question can you read this text no not really all right Okay, good. Uh, so I guess first of all, you know, libexec ldelf.so uh, bin echo high. Uh, probably not quickly. <laughs> I'll make it bigger. How's that? <laughs> Instead of turning off the colors. Yeah. So there we go. Um, and maybe not quite that big. This is a very low resolution screen, but oh well, we'll live with it. Um, Right, so here is a little application. Can you see that? No, not really? Uh, all right. I think that's something I can quick fa fix fairly quickly. And let's crank it all the way up to eight. Woo! I have a high DPI screen, you see. And this is less of a high DPI screen. OK, uh, so here we have an example of a little application that you would not actually write, but it's just kind of for these demo, demo purposes. Uh, that's going to open the runtime linker explicitly. It's going to open a binary that we specify by name from argv. Uh, we're going to construct some arguments, which include dash f and the file descriptor number. And then we're going to pass whatever arguments were remaining from the command line. Um, and then we're going to call f exec. OK, good. So that would look something like this. So let's run uh, bin echo hello world. All right, and that works very nicely. Hooray, hooray, are we all done? No, no, of course we're not all done. We still have 10 minutes. Um, let's try this with cap enter. So we're going to open all the resources that we need. Enter capability mode, and then we're going to execute the binary that we wanted to run. So let's try this now. Uh, I guess I should probably compile that, hey? Yeah. And I think we were using echo here. Very sophisticated applications. Nope. So we have this implicit resource problem. Your application didn't say, please go and open slash lib slash libc.so.7, but something in your application sure did. So how are we going to deal with that? 
Right, so this also problems, right? Uh, no, no, not quite. Um, so, remember, applications need dynamic libraries. Unless you're using uh, Mac OS X, in which case you definitely need dynamic libraries because you're not supposed to have statically linked binaries. So the runtime linker is just code that's running in your address space, right? It's not a separate process or something. It's just code in your address space that when you call a function that hasn't been dynamically linked in yet, Instead of calling that function, you end up in linker code, which patches things up and then continues executing. Um, before main, it finds all the libraries it needs. And well, when you're running from in capability mode, it can't do that. So the actual linking can happen at runtime. That's fine. That's just computation, or that's just uh, that's just computation on files that you've already opened and mmapped. Uh, but you can't open these libraries from capability mode. So um, here, normally, when we're looking for libraries, um, we look at, and yeah, this, this code is as fun to read as you might think it is. Uh, actually, it's pretty well structured. I shouldn't complain. It's sophisticated and it has to be complicated. It's, anyway, um, so we have an RT path, unless that there's something about DSOs and a run path that's set in the binary. We consult the LD library path. Uh, environment variable, then we check DT run path, we check config, or we check linker hints, unless you're using dash Z, no default lib, yeah, again, it's fine. And then finally, you fall back to a standard library path, which uh, can be things like lib32, user lib32, uh, on 64-bit architectures often, it actually starts with slash lib slash Casper, then it's lib, user, lib, etc. So that's what we would normally do to find libraries. Um, and so this LD library path environment variable is a very very interesting idea. You can say, here's some places where you can look for libraries. So we've provided another version of that. So uh, we've provided another version, which is LD library path FDs. So you can say, dear runtime linker, here are some file descriptors, which represent directories that contain libraries. So that's something that you can access from within capability mode. You're not allowed to access global namespaces, but if you say inside of this directory that I've already given you access to, as long as you don't try using dot dots or anything, you're allowed to access files within that using open at or access at or stat at. Right. So then, uh, so in our little demo here, if I uncomment this line, uh, you'll see that uh, we can set an environment variable, LD library path FDs, with the contents of whatever open library does gives us, which is just this other function that I wrote, which again, slightly ugly, but should be provided for you. Um, and if we do that, then now we can run bin echo. Okay, hey, so we can run echo. Yay, it's very exciting. Uh, and just to show you there's nothing up my sleeve, we can run other things. User bin pom. The moon is waning gibbous for example, how, how interesting to know that. Um, but something we can't do in cat, see password. That's not permitted in capability mode because, well, you're not allowed to access things uh, in global namespaces in capability mode. Okay, so we're getting a little bit closer, but we're still not quite there. We can run our RTLD. So we can run it, we can run the application, RTLD can find the libraries, RTLD can run the binary and do all the linking it needs to do. So now do we have profit? Now have we arrived? Well, the answer is still not quite. Um, so here are, uh, here's where we are so far. So libraries are actually not quite enough. If we try to run cat, for example, then things, uh, our application fails. Now at least it fails closed. Right? So we aren't left wondering, boy, I wonder if my, my application is secure enough. Uh, I can go to bed confident that nobody's going to exploit my application in the middle of the night without my knowledge. And it's just that at the moment it doesn't quite <clears throat> work. So we also need support for getting more ac uh, access to more resources. So um, applications as they exist, tend to like to use paths a lot. They tend to use functions or system calls like access and stat and open and things, none of which are allowed. Now we could rewrite the application to take some directory descriptors and use all open at and stat at and access at and all those kinds of things. But of course, our whole goal here is to have oblivious sandbox and we don't want the applications to have to be modified. We want to run them without modification. That wouldn't really be oblivious. 
And so that is where a library comes in that uh, we are continuing to work on, but have recently made some uh, progress. Um, so, and to the point where we actually now do useful things with it. So we are able, with our pre-opening library, um, to pre-open directories and in fact files, and then create mappings of here's a name, here's a file descriptor, here's a name, here's a file descriptor with some capability rights and things. Which means um, that we can provide the libc wrappers for various system calls like open and access and things. So we can use LD pre-open because LD pre-open works in conjunction with LD library path FD, so that works. So we can inject libc uh, wrappers and overload some weak symbols and things in order to take precedence over the open uh, system call and the access system call and things. And in these wrappers, we look through a mapping of pre-opened file descriptor and directory descriptors, and we do some translation. So if you ask for user local share my application foo.conf, well, we can see that if somebody's pre-opened user local share my application for you, then, well, we can just say, all right, that's file descriptor three, and the relative path is this. And that's something you can pass to one of the at functions. Yes? So if, for example, uh, yes, you could just provide user local share, but in this particular scenario, I'm saying, well, if I'm running the FooBar app, then it doesn't need access to user local share, uh, you know, X screensaver or something. Uh, it only needs access to this, so I can pre-open this. If you wanted to, you could, you know, pre-open the root directory, but that would kind of defeat the purpose. Uh, but you could, if you wanted to have an effective policy that says, well, you can access anything on the file system, or maybe you can access anything on the file system read-only, um, you could provide that policy, but you'd have to do it very explicitly. There would be no wondering, hmm, I wonder what this thing has resources to. It would have to be done in an explicit and clear way. So if you have uh, passed in one of these pre-open files, then great. If not, then, well, we just say, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you don't have access to that, and we can actually call the underlying system call to get the normal error message. Okay, but where does this come from? So remember, we want to launch an unmodified application from a sandbox. So who pre-opens the files and directories? Well, whatever the thing is that's doing the launching. And... Um, that thing is going to have to do some fork and pre-opening, put things into a PO map and some recent work. Now we can take that and pack it into POSIX shared memory and then we can set various things and set PO map and we can F exec and then we can let our libc wrappers go find this shared memory segment, unpack the mapping information and then do the translation that we just talked about. The thing that does all that work should not be every single application. The thing that does that work should be, in some sense, a shell. So what we're doing as a proof of concept is developing a shell called CAPTCH because it's a capability aware shell. 10 minutes, okay, cool. And that, uh, that capability aware shell is just demonstrating how all these concepts can work. And the idea is that then this logic can be put into a library that other shells could link against. So maybe not bin sh, maybe bin sh, we'll see. Um, so when you want to launch sandbox applications, you would call this library and you would do these things. It would, first, we can use open or open at to get at the, the binary and the linker we want. We can open library directories. We can open a working directory. Oh, I see that you are um, running uh, make. I happen to know that when you run make, you're going to want access to the current directory. So let me pre-open the current working directory for you. That's something that I can then hand in and that can be used by lib pre-open. The thing, the capability shell in this case, will call cap enter. So before we even look at the untrusted code, uh, we're already in a sandbox. And then we can start doing all of these things. <coughs> and the goal here, uh, and so now we can start talking about, and we can, obliviously sandbox simple applications. So where are we today? Um, so it's not a real shell, you know, we, you can run CAPTCH and then some things, you can't run CAPTCH and then it presents a prompt and you do, you know, shell scripting or something in it, but that's not really the goal. Other people know how to write shells that you can script. This is sort of a proof of concept to show how you can launch things in sandboxes. It's also uh, not very sophisticated. Um, we can 
We can run echo. I'll prove that to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so capsh echo hello. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, my installed version of capsh is. Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, sorry. Build a version that I have not installed yet, which does even better than that. Capsh echo hello. And it'll search through the path. So that's very nice. It'll pre open all the directories that are specified by path. So that's very nice. Now I know what everybody's really wondering will it run true? And yes, the answer is it does run true. Pardon? Uh, So, you know, at the moment, we can run <coughs> some not very sophisticated applications, sophisticated applications. However, the infrastructure is now in place to start doing the interesting work and the stuff that's going to be a lot more fun where we start to seriously engage with applications and the modes in which they run and the things they need to do. It does execute unmodified software from within Capsicum sandboxes, which we have been thinking about since 2010, when we first published the Capsicum work, but we haven't done until you know a couple of months ago. So that's actually kind of cool. We're, some of the infrastructural things are in place now for sandboxing programs by default. And so where we want to get, uh, we want to be able to, or we need to be able to provide certain services to applications when they're sandboxed. So static pre-open files, okay, we can get those things from things like command line arguments. So you have typed cat or head Etsy password, well, I see that you've typed something as a command line argument that I can find as a file. So let me pre-open that for you. Uh, maybe you've typed, uh, I want to run CC, and I want to pass in this source file, and here's an output file, colon W. OK, let me pre-open that for you in a writable mode. So these things that you named at the command line, you can read only, so your compiler can't you know, write things into your source code. It can only write things into the object code, for example. But an example of a compiler is something where we're going to need more sophisticated policies than that, because Clang needs access to a lot more than just a source file, right? It needs access to include files and libraries and all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, crazy things like include header files. Um, but also, we're going to have to have some dynamic provisioning. Things like an application that, I, mean, I know it's a BSD conference, but there are applications that want to interact with the user through like a graphical mechanism. Yeah, I know, I know. It's okay. Put your hands over your ears if you can't handle it. Um, but yeah, this is a thing that real applications want to do. Uh, so things like enabling, enabling power box models where we say, I want to open a file. Could you please ask the user which file they want opened and give me a file descriptor back? These are things that we played with in the initial capsicum work, but not in like a productionable way. Now it's time to revisit those for real. Um, things like policies that a user might specify. So a package might specify, here are the resources I need to run. You could imagine having system policies and user policies that compose with those, where the application says, I'd really like access to all these things. And the user says, mm, no, not so much. So there's a policy composition and analysis question, which is going to be you know, a whole very fruitful area of research. Now that we have the research prototype built, we can actually start doing the interesting questions around policies. We can imagine some static policies looking kind of like this. This is where we're going hopefully very soon. I know uh, Baptiste has been waiting very patiently since we had a chat at uh, FOSDEM in 2014 about what this would look like. But again, now it's time to actually do it. Um, you could imagine packages shipping uh, Okay, uh, you can imagine packages shipping with policy descriptions that look like this, saying here are all the resources that this version of Clang needs in order to run. Here's where it's going to uh, find its libraries and include files and all those kinds of things and standard arg.h and all these weird and wacky things are going to be found underneath this directory. So please pre-open that for me with these writes. Or I want to be able to act. I need to be able to run applications called Clang anything and ll anything that I found in user local bin. Don't bother pre-opening for them, them for me, but when I ask for uh, LLI or LLVM link, go out and get that for me. Um, but if the name doesn't match these globs, then you know that's, that's not a legitimate request. Maybe I've been compromised because 
believe it or not, you can compromise compilers with malformatted C code. People do all kinds of fun things. Um, so you can imagine lots of policies that could be shipped with applications say, here are things that my application needs in order to work correctly. Um, those dynamic services could include higher level services like uh, go connect to this thing and give me all the information, uh, go connect to this thing, do some TLS validation and give me the certificate information back. I don't need to do all the TLS validation myself, but I would quite like to know what certificate or what the root certificate was. So I can just check, do I like this certificate or not? Which is a much better question to have to ask than every application to have to figure out, oh, am I using the, uh, the APIs correctly to do certificate valid validation? Because something like 95% you know, of application make mistakes in certificate valid validation because the APIs suck. And that's also getting better. People are working on fixing that through various mechanisms, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, so you can have application level services, uh, handing things off to worker process, session level services like UI power boxes, other parts of the same login session that you're working with that talk to each other over DBUS, providing user data such as uh, you know calendaring events and contact details and the kinds of things that applications, maybe not Unix binaries, but kind of larger applications want to deal with at a higher level of semantics than open uh, you know, home directory slash dot contact slash something, just can you connect me to the contact service, please, and ask the user to choose a contact to email this to. As well as system level services, and these are the kinds of things that Libcasper has been focusing on so far, the system.dns service, for example. It's useful and important, uh, but now we're in a position to start pushing up into the higher level and more interesting services that are closer to the applications. So now, from the Capsicum Sandbox, we can pre-open libraries and binaries. We can run RTLD directly, and it knows what to do with library directory file descriptors. It can map binaries and run them from capability mode. We can wrap up these ambient authority system calls and translate them into versions that do not require ambient authority for those resources that we've been explicitly delegated. So only when someone has said, you must, or I explicitly choose to give you access to, the, to this directory, then we can do that that stuff, otherwise we fail closed. Um, and now we're starting to think about, okay, providing access to named system services. So, Capsicum has always been, uh, the point of it has been to provide principled and coherent compartmentalization. Um, but now we have some support for running on modified applications with useful services. And now it's time to start pressing into the really interesting work, the really interesting research, um, so that we can have this deeper exploration of oblivious sandboxing. So we want we are starting to move towards a world where applications, such as binaries that we install from packages, should both work and be secured by default. Any other questions? I think I have a minute and a half left. Yes? If that work with limited um, versions of fork that do not reestablish all endings? Sorry? Like, uh, consider the clone system call, which is like fork, except it doesn't um, remap everything and there are some shared um, memory regions left. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I guess there are a couple of points I'd like to make there. One is that things like the clone system call in uh, that Linux uses, um, it does use extensively for, and, and this is not the talk where I'm going to slag off all the other sandboxing mechanisms. That's a talk I'm going to give at VBSDCon, actually, so if you want to come to that. Um, but that... Um, to my mind, the problem with the clone system call and the need for all these separate namespaces and things is because the right thing to do is to have a simpler policy that says don't have any access to global namespaces as opposed to I'm going to have to create another PID namespace and then I'm going to have to create a set UID helper which can translate between PIDs in this namespace and PIDs in that namespace and correspondence between those and network namespaces and file system namespaces and cheroots and uh, all that complexity comes in from a lack of a willingness to just say no paths. 
no, no capes. Um, and so that's part of it. I think the other part of the question is that if you have, if you're trying to preserve memory mappings and things, um, I mean, I think, I think linking the library is not really the hard part of the problem, right? That's not where most of our complexity and performance impact comes in and stuff. I think, I think the real issue has to do with if you have to have lots of RPCs generated, then that's a real cost of compartmentalization. But um, you know, linking stuff is not such a big deal. Mm -hmm. Pick up the data, not via like system file shared memory, which would result in different virtual addresses, but keeping the virtual addresses for this attack. But I can already see that there's a security problem there because if it's the same user ID, you could modify not the executable code, but you could modify like the stack internal address address from a different thread or something. Potentially, yeah. So I'm going to try to get this one down in front before somebody cuts me off. So, um, Capsicum is a great sandboxing framework. Um, Thank you. Okay, let's all move on. <laughs> <laughs> I am a fan of Capsicum, but with that said, um, I just want to make clear that the whole that it we can't blanketly claim that Capsicum makes applications secure by default in all cases. Well, this is the goal. Because We're moving towards. Towards is there, yeah. Does not and by design cannot um, uh, address in memory data only attacks. Absolutely. So Capsicum so is entirely. Not all attackers are interested in popping a shell. That's true. And it's absolutely true that this is within, or this is still works with the Unix idea of what a security domain is, which is an address space. This doesn't address like address space layout randomization or all the kind of defenses one might want to have within a security domain. That, that's true. That's, that is also you know, important so stuff to think about. When we talk about Capsicum in public settings, we should understand that there are limits to that phrase secure by default. That, that, yeah, that, that's fair enough. This is perhaps a bit of a reach. I mean, this is the goal. This is the ambition. This is where we want to get. And Capsicum is part of an overall story. It's also true that we shouldn't have, you know, um, integer overflow errors in the kernel because, you know, then the security is uh, completely gone as well. So, yeah, that, that's a fair point. Thanks. Who are doing application what based on machine? Application whitelisting. Oh, kind of, I see. You know, it's a behavioral, behavioral based analytics for applications. Have you guys had any conversations with folks with that? Um, not really. Um, so. I guess the short answer is not really. And maybe there are more thoughts, but maybe we should take those offline. Yeah, I do have concerns about some techniques that have foundations which are not necessarily rigorous in the sense of uh, taking care of atomicity issues and things. I think people have gotten themselves into trouble by implementing policies that they think provide security but actually aren't robust in the face of an attacker um, and subject to race conditions and things. Um, but, you know, I don't want to address any specifics or slag anybody off or anything. So, any other questions? I guess let's go party and watch Dan auction his clothing.